Joining me now to discuss this and all of the day's top stories live from Darwin is Sky News Darwin Bureau Chief Matt Cunningham. Matt, why do you think that two former Prime Ministers here in Keating and in Turnbull have felt the need to intervene on this $368 billion deal? Well, I think there are probably different reasons for each of them. When it comes to Paul Keating, I think he's always been a strong supporter of a closer relationship uh, with China. That was certainly the case when he was Prime Minister, and it remains the case now. But Tim Watts there made, makes the good point that, that times have certainly changed a lot since Paul Keating uh, was Prime Minister. I thought Keating's comments about Penny Wong in particular were a bit over the top. It was a real personal attack that he made uh, against her and they've come back to bite him today. And we've even seen Anthony Albanese uh, say today that the person uh, really who, who, who's had the most damage done to them by the comments that Paul Keating made uh, was Paul Keating uh, himself. I, I think he's right about that. Uh, when it comes to Malcolm Turnbull's criticism, I think Malcolm Turnbull's trying to protect his own legacy. He's trying to protect uh, his government's decision uh, to do that deal, to sign that deal with the French uh, over the, the submarine contract that most independent analysts said really was not the deal that was in Australia's best interests. And I think you, you've heard most uh, of the sensible commentary since then, talk about the need for nuclear submarines, talk, talk about the need for a closer relationship with the UK and the US, and that's what we're seeing happen under AUKUS. It's interesting because, of course, both of them uh, were quite... Had, had quite a bit of vitriol when they spoke about, um, you know, in, in Turnbull's case, Scott Morrison, he called him reckless, and Keating uh, pretty much said that Anthony Albanese was incompetent. But they both did raise a valid point in that there has been no debate or discussion, not even the Labor Party had a discussion about this deal that will cost Australia at least $368 billion. Uh, some of the points Keating made... Um, seem to be quite valid, not being a submarine expert, but, you know, he said it, the, the size of the submarines are so bulky they would be discoverable from space. He said they're not suitable for Australia's shallow waters off our coast uh, and that uh, it's just going to have a conventional weapon system. It's not a nuclear weapon system. Um, so, you know, aren't these valid points that potentially we should be discussing and, and, and the only people who perhaps had the courage to raise any criticisms are former Prime Ministers? Well, $368 billion is certainly an eye-watering eye amount of money and, and, and I guess you're right to say that there should be uh, certainly a, a debate, a discussion and an analysis of that decision if we are committing to a project uh, of that size and that cost. And there are a lot of questions about, uh, you know, whether by the time, you know, these submarines are built, they're still going to be fit for purpose. It's a difficult um, debate. It's a difficult situation. But at the same time, I, I think the deal that we were signing up to with uh, the French uh, to build those submarines was not going to put us in a good position. Under this deal, we are going to have some of those submarines, albeit second-hand submarines sooner, so our capability uh, will be there earlier. Uh, and I think that uh, given uh, the place that the global climate's in at the moment, particularly in our region, I think, uh, you know, we really do need uh, to be more closely al aligned with the yeah. United States. Yeah. Now, attention is turning to how this would be funded. The cost of the NDIS is growing. It's rising $75 million per month. This is one area that has been raised uh, and the government may look to make changes to the scheme, including reviewing support for children with autism. Matt, do you think the NDIS... Do you think this should be the first area to face cuts in order to pay for the nuclear-powered submarines? Well, it's difficult, isn't it? Because it is an important program, the NDIS, and, and for any family uh, who has a child with a disability, they would say that the NDIS is crucial. Uh, and if you, you, you weigh it up simply on a... Like, should we spend $368 billion, you know, on a, on a submarine program versus, you know, should we, um, you know, fund some of the most vulnerable people in our society, then, you know, you'd say it's a no-brainer. You wouldn't cut money out of the NDIS. But I do think there are issues with the ballooning cost of the NDIS. We're talking about a program that by 2026 is going to ta cost taxpayers uh, more than $50 billion. Uh, and so I do think we need to have a look at the NDIS, how it's working, where that money's going. There was a story in News Corp papers only a few days ago, you know, saying that uh, NDIS participants and their families, you know, were able uh, to use that funding to, to spend up to $15,000 on a holiday on the Gold Coast. I don't think most people would think that that uh, is 
really where the money under the NDIS should be going. So, I mean, it's it's a difficult, you know, to, to yeah. just compare one to the other, but yeah. I do think that we do need to look at NDIS and how it's working at the moment. Yeah. Now, AUMO, that's the Australian energy market operator, has reported today that there's going to be a gas shortage this year. This is what they had to say. The supply of gas to southeastern Australia is declining faster than demand. Now, from 2027 onwards, uh, we're highlighting the need for investment in new sources of gas supply to overcome forecast annual shortfalls each year from then on. Now, this is also expected to add to power bills, Matt. But in another comment today, former PM Malcolm Turnbull said the gas supply mechanism should have been triggered last year. And this, of course, regulates exports to make sure that there'd be enough supply for our domestic market before the gas is sent offshore. Here's what he had to say. It's a pity the government didn't actually trigger the Australian domestic gas security mechanism uh, last year because that would have then given the government the absolute power to prevent gas being exported if it was at the expense of domestic supply. This is a very difficult one politically. We've seen Albanese in the past week uh, say that gas is going to be essential in managing the transition to renewable energy. We've had Dan Andrews come out today. I mean, look, action should have been taken well before now to, to, if we are facing these domestic gas shortages, as AEMO said today. Yeah, Malcolm Turnbull's right when he says that we probably should have uh, hit that trigger last year. But long before we hit that trigger, Shari, what we should have done was made sure that we'd done more to boost domestic production. Right here in the Northern Territory at the moment, there's, uh, according to some estimates, 300 trillion cubic feet of gas underneath the ground in the Beetaloo Basin here in the Northern Territory, enough gas to supply our domestic energy needs uh, for more than 200 years, and yet for more than a decade, producers have been unable to get that gas out of the ground. They're still trying now, but they're probably still a couple of years away because of the regulations that are being put uh, in place. I was listening to some of the discussion on this issue um, today from Melbourne and Sydney, and all of the talk was about people in households reducing demand. Well, I think that's only going to have a very small impact on this issue. We're still going to need gas for so many things, and what we need to do is increase production uh, you know, there are plenty of places where we can do that, particularly here in the Northern Territory, and I think we need to get out of the way or get governments out of the way and allow those companies to get in there and produce that gas so that we can help alleviate this crisis. Yeah. Now, Matt, you've done uh, some quite amazing and emotional reporting, uh, particularly in Alice Springs, on the Northern Territory surge in crime rates, also ch child protection issues. Um, what is the current state of affairs uh, a couple of weeks after the Prime Minister made that dash to the Northern Territory? Well, there, according to some people and according to the Northern Territory Government, there has been a, a reduction in crime at some level, particularly alcohol fueled crime. Some pretty drastic measures that were put in place. I mean, takeaway alcohol sales have been banned two days a week. Uh, police are calling for those bans to be extended and there's some evidence that that is having an impact and also the return of those uh, alcohol bans to Aboriginal town camps and some of those smaller Indigenous communities, which is also uh, having a positive effect. But people are also concerned about continued and perhaps rising uh, instances of break and enters and car theft. I yeah. spoke to Josh Burgoyne from the country Liberal Party. He's a local Alice Springs MP. He said uh, there was eight cars stolen on one night recently. Uh, wow. Just last night, there was a car that was stolen in Alice Springs with a two-year-old child in that car in the back seat. And that car was missing uh, after being stolen for two hours. It was later found oh. abandoned on the side of the road. Police have now apprehended the person they believe stole that car. But you can only imagine what sort of ordeal that was um, for the for the mother of that child. Just so I think we're a long way from solving nightmare. the problems in Alice Springs, Sharon. Yeah. Matt Cunningham, thanks so much for joining me this evening.